Um, this morning, I want to start uh, a series, I believe it's going to be a series. In fact, Paul, I can tell you right now, I'm not going to preach this whole message, so get ready to go probably straight to point number five. I have nine points, but I'm just going to probably deliver just two points this morning. But I want to talk to you, uh, I want to do a series on a call to forgiveness. And if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Matthew chapter 18. We're going to look at one passage of Scripture this morning. Um, so many of you know I flew in last night from the Dominican Republic where we have about a dozen people there who have joined Kurt and Debbie Holthus. Uh, and they are doing a powerful ministry there in the Dominican Republic. It's the very first medical missions trip that I've ever been on. And um, I actually have a couple of pictures I'm going to share with you. And I'm not going to steal all the team's thunder, but uh, I do want to show a couple of pictures. Uh, this first one is us riding to the place. You can see Kira Ward is actually laying down on the ground. There's her head right there in the middle. And uh, we, we rode many times an hour, hour and a half to these re uh, re uh, remote villages and ministered uh, medical needs. The next picture is a picture of uh, our, our uh, some of our teenagers. This is Katie uh, Hurley giving a testimony uh, to the children there in the playground. The next picture, keep it going for me if you will. The next one is Nicole and Elena. Uh, 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 they're doing a skit uh, for our children. And then the next one is um, uh, our, our youth group doing a skit also for our children. They saw as of two days ago, we saw 450 decisions that were made and turned in for Jesus. Come on, can you say amen? Here's Nicole hugging and loving on one of those beautiful Dominican babies, little girls. The next picture is, uh, you can't really see this, but this is just lined up. This is the medical tent that we set up. And there are literally hundreds of people lined up on the outside a wall there. Um, they pass out tickets because the need's just way too great. And this is another lineup going into the medical, sick, uh, picture, uh, medical area of people just needing medical care. The next picture is um, these, uh, this is just some of the stations that they have inside. They had a whole crew of doctors. You'll see a picture in just a moment. This is a guy giving a, 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 a lady a, a cortisone shot in her knee so that she could walk again. This picture is a, one of the uh, uh, doctors there. He was a pediatric doctor who came and uh, was helping our children. It was sad to see all the children who were in desperate need of medical care. This is all the doctors that came. Look at that. These are doctors and nurses that came, and they treated... As of two days ago, they treated over 2,000 patients. Um, uh, this is uh, some of them giving out glasses and so forth. And, um, and then the next one is uh, Elena doing uh, some of the pre, doing the blood pressure and, and uh, weight and temperature and so forth, getting the patients ready to see the doctors. And I took a love to dentistry. I don't know what in the world. I was spending most of my time in the prayer tent. And, but next thing I know, I'm over in the dentistry department, and I've learned so much about dentistry. Uh, and I'm going to talk Andy and Celeste going with me next year. But, so this is me pulling a tooth. And, uh, and uh, the next picture, you'll see that I did it successfully. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! So half pliers will serve you this morning. I know exactly what I'm doing. So uh, if you, if you, you know, need medical care this morning, come see me at the office. It will not take long, okay? But I know how to do it. I have proof right there. I am a dentist. Hallelujah. <laughs> I have a feeling nobody's going to take me up on that one. It's okay. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about a call to forgiveness. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus, um, well, Peter comes to, to Jesus, and beginning in verse 21, Jesus is already talking about forgiveness, and Peter, in response um, to that, comes to Jesus, and um, he says to Jesus, he asks him, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Now, can I tell you something? Just the question alone 
tells you that he has an issue with forgiveness. How many times? I mean, seriously? It can, even the question itself shows a spirit of judgment and um, lack of mercy, lack of grace, lack, lack of forgiveness. How many times? How many times, Lord? And he thinks he's really self-righteous. He, he, you know, up to seven times, Lord? You know, not just three, but seven, the number of completion and blah, blah, blah. It, you know, seven times, Lord? And Jesus answers and he tells him, no, not seven times, but seven De, seven, de seven, or many translations say 70 times seven times. In other words, Peter, you just need to continue to forgive, continue to forgive, continue to forgive. Don't start counting. Don't go, okay, you got only one more time and that's it, Jack. I mean, no, no, no. You continue to forgive. And then Jesus tells this parable. And I want, I'm, listen, there's some tension in this verse. Okay? But in a day when we have such a sloppy agape, a, such a sloppy grace, I think we need to stop and let the Bible speak for itself. Okay? This verse of Scripture really is a scary verse of Scripture. Because Jesus goes on in verse 23, he says this. He's going to describe the kingdom of heaven. Okay? He's describing the kingdom of heaven. This is what I want. I want heaven on earth. Amen? I want heaven in my life. I want heaven in my, my, my family. I want heaven in, in my congregation. I want heaven in my community. And he says, I'm going to describe heaven to you. If you want to talk about forgiveness, Peter, let me describe heaven to you and how it works in the kingdom of heaven. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Now, at the end of this parable, Jesus tells us who the king is. And the king is his heavenly father. Kingdom of heaven, the king is his father. At the very end, you'll see. This, he'll, he'll actually tell you who the king is. Okay? Now, let's let the Bible speak for itself. Regardless of what you've been taught, let's let the Bible speak for itself. All right? He says, the king, my father, who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began to settle... As he began to, uh, uh, the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. I want you to think about that. Now, we read through the Bible, and we really don't, you know, we just, we just read through it. We really don't think about the magnitude of statements sometimes. He says, this man had, had owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and he was just unable. There was no way that he could pay this debt. And the master ordered that his wife and his children and all that he had be sold and to repay the debt. He, he, he owed this astronomical debt that was just impossible for him to pay. In fact, I quickly did some homework to find out exactly how much 10,000 talents was. And I want you to see this. He owed 10,000 talents. One talent is eight years of wages. He owed 80 years of wages, 80,000 years of wages. Methuselah couldn't have paid that. Right? I mean, the man who lived the longest than the whole, anybody else. He owed 80,000 years of wages. Okay, let, put it in comparison. Remember in Matthew chapter 25 when he tells the parable uh, about uh, the, the master who owned eight talents. And he couldn't find anybody who was uh, able to even oversee eight talents. And he had to give five, two, and one. That was eight. Eight. This guy owed 10,000. Okay? We're talking about, ask, we just read through the Bible. Eh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 listen. This is impossible. 80,000 years of continual labor. He could not pay this guy's debt. No wonder he's in anguish. He knows it's impossible. And, 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 the, and the king is, is like, well, I'm going to settle up my debt, sell his wife, sell his kids to slavery, put him in prison, sell everything he's owned. I'm gonna, you know, I know it's not even going to come close, but I'm going to settle. And the guy, the Bible goes on to say in verse 26, and the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me. He begged, 
and I will pay back everything. There is no way that's going to happen. And the servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt. Say canceled. And let him go. How many of you know this is a picture of you and me standing before God and our inability to pay back our debt to the Lord? And yet God, out of mercy and out of grace, out of love, canceled. Say canceled. Canceled our debt. And he let us go free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Aren't you so glad he is patient and merciful and loving and kind? Amen. Amen. And this guy, he, listen, the gratitude of being set free of 80,000 years of wages. Woo-hoo! Dude, he should have been the most generous, kind, gracious, merciful, patient person in the planet. Amen? Amen. Yet, the Bible says, but. When that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Not a hundred talents, a hundred denarii. And watch what he did. And he grabbed him and began to choke him. Listen, understand the viciousness of that. It's one thing for me not to forgive Ronnie of a debt. But for me to manhandle and begin to choke him is, I mean, it's, that's absolutely insulting. That's degrading, right? Don't you feel it, bro? Let's get into this, boy. I mean, the Bible says that he was so heartless, so merciless, he not only just said, no, you will pay me now. And you, no, he grabs him and begins to publicly choke this guy. I mean, it's like, are you serious? He begins to choke him. He says, pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And just as he did before his master, his fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him. And he says the exact same thing. Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused, and instead he went off and had the man thrown in prison until he could pay the debt. Whoa! Now here's the mind-boggling part. Do you know how much he owed him? Look at this. He owed 100 denarii. It takes 6,000 denarii to make one talent. How much did he get forgiven for? 10,000 talents. And yet he could not forgive one sixtieth of a talent. In other words, he could not forgive six million times less a debt than what he was just forgiven. Now listen to me, church. I don't care what has happened to you. I don't care if somebody's murdered your child. In comparison to what God has forgiven you, it is six million times less. I don't care if you've been raped. And I'm not being heartless. I'm just saying I don't care what your scenario is. It mind boggles me. The people who will ruin their life because they want to hold a grudge. The people who will destroy themselves because they don't understand what lack of forgiveness is doing in their life. He was forgiven, what was it, 80,000 years of wages and could not forgive his neighbor for one sixtieth of a talent. Choking him publicly. Choking him. No, you will pay me now. What a tyrant. And yet Jesus is showing us a picture of ourself when we refuse to forgive an offense. That's not even the heavy part. And watch this. Let the Bible speak for itself, not modern day preachers. Watch this. Verse 31. And when the other servants saw what had happened, because again, he did this publicly. When all of his his friends 
And all the other servants saw what was happening. They were greatly distressed. I mean, wouldn't you, if your friend was, was just set free of 80,000 years of wages, and then you saw him turn around and choke somebody and throw him into prison for just measly pennies, wouldn't you get a little ticked? Dude, I would be. I would slap be ticked. I would be distressed. I would be upset. And all of his fellow servants are seeing this, and they're going, and they went directly to their master. And they, and they told him what had happened. And watch what the master said. Now, who's the master? Heavenly Father. Watch what the master said. The master called the servant in. He said, you wicked servant. Wicked. I canceled all that debt that of yours. Why? Because you begged me to. Watch this. Go on. Verse 33. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in anger, his master, let me tell you something, God does get angry. And in anger, because of such injustice and lack of mercy, he turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay all he owed. And Jesus says, and this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers from your heart. Not just lip forgiveness. We're talking about genuinely release them from your heart. Now listen, I'm telling you, I'm speaking to some people this morning. Now, let the Bible speak for itself. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus doesn't exaggerate. Jesus doesn't um, manipulate. Jesus just tells it just like it is. And it's real clear. You had a debt that you absolutely could not pay. And if you refuse to forgive someone who offends you, it could be your child, it could be your spouse, it could be a boss, it could be a neighbor. You refuse to do that. Here's the, here's the scary part. Here's the tension part for me. His debt was already canceled. But because he refused to extend that mercy to somebody else, guess what? It was put right back in, into place. He was thrown into prison to be tortured on a debt that had already been canceled. Deal with the tension of that one, church. So I have like nine points that I was going to share this morning, but I'm, going to, I'm just going to go straight to point number five, Paul. And the reason, there are, there are nine, or actually I had 12 reasons why we don't forgive, but I think one of the main reasons we don't forgive that some people have a hard time forgiving is because they forget just how much the Lord has forgiven them. We forget. And the longer that we're in this thing called Christianity, and the farther we get away from that point of initial forgiveness, the easier it is for us to forget what the Lord has done. It's, it's so easy to forget that, that many of us in this room were alcoholics at one time. And drug addicts at some one time. And, and, and sexually promiscuous at one time. And, and angry at one time. And empty at one time. It's so easy for us to forget that, that we would cry ourselves to sleep out in despair at one time. And God set us free. He liberated us and he gave to us life and life more abundantly. And when you forget just what God has done for you, then the next thing happens is you become self-righteous. You, you start thinking more highly of yourself than you ought. You start looking down upon others. You start expecting other people to treat you a certain way. You know what I tell my peers? 
I said, well, one of the problems with us preachers is we expect people to respect us and honor us. And that is rightful. But can I tell you something? They did not do that for Jesus. And we're no better than Jesus. But when you have unrealistic expectations, you set yourself up for offenses. Let that one chew. Listen, they despised Jesus, they ridiculed, they hung Jesus. And yet preachers are the worst to think that people ought to put them on a pedestal. That's wrong. Paul said, I'm an apostle, I'm, a, I'm the scum of the earth. We are the scum of the earth, and you're exalted. We forget what God has done for us. And when we do, we forget to extend that to others. In this parable, I just read it to you. He says, shouldn't you have had mercy on fellow servant just as I had on for you? The sixth reason why I was going to share this morning of why we have a tendency of not forgiving is because we forget that God will forgive us according to how we forgive others. Now, you've got to deal with that. that. This is Bible. This is not Richard's opinion. I'm just reading straight from the Bible. In fact, in the Lord's Prayer, right. it ends. And we all know it. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then Jesus goes right back in to, to basically expound on the prayer a little bit as if to say, oh, by the way, maybe the most important part of this prayer is the part about forgiveness. Because he begins to expound on it in verse 14. For if you forgive men when they have sinned against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Don't ask me to explain that. That's just what Jesus said. Well, preacher, you don't understand what they've done to me. Listen, there are no stipulations here. You don't, you don't understand how many times that they've done it to me. It doesn't say. Well, 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 preacher, listen, preacher. They're not repentant. I can't forgive them unless they repent. Oh, really? Have you, read, have you read the account of the crucifixion lately? Where Jesus is on the cross and he's dying and he says these words, Father, forgive them. They were not repenting. Forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. I have forgiven tons of people through the years who never came and asked for an apology. Tons. I don't want to carry your sin around in my spirit. I don't want to be poisoned because of your sin against me. Do you understand that when you carry an offense, you poison your own spirit? You're not hurting them, you're hurting yourself. You poison. I know Christians, they have no joy. And it's because of offenses. There are certain people I run from them like the plague. Because they're always complaining about something. They're always offended about something. They're always upset about something. You know what their problem is? Lack of forgiveness. It's not even lack of forgiveness toward me. It's lack of forgiveness toward a brother. A lack of forgiveness toward a child. A lack of forgiveness toward a spouse or an ex-spouse or, or a boss. They got done wrong. Okay, you got done wrong. Get over it. Release it. Get rid of it. See, we, we, we forget that we get forgiven as we have forgiven. Paul, go to, I'm going to, I'm going to close with point number eight. We forget.
forget because we don't realize that we actually bind the sin that was committed against us into our spirit only to be manifested later in our lives. Matthew 18, the entire second half of the chapter is about forgiveness. And you've got to interpret scripture in light of the context. And one of our favorite passages of scripture that we like to, uh, to quote is, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Right? We love to quote that. Do you understand that it's not necessarily talking in this passage of scripture about binding and loosing demons? It's talking about forgiveness. Look at verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. Verse 16. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as he, you would a pagan or a tax collector. And I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Talking about forgiveness. As a youth pastor working with teenagers for years, it dumbfounded me at least for a decade. I could not understand how a young man who grew up with a dad who was an alcoholic would get saved and, and, and would swear up and down, I will never touch alcohol. I hate alcohol. I hate what it did to my dad. I hate what it did to my family. And many times, even though he accepted Christ as a teenager, 10, 20 years later, I hear that he's an alcoholic. And I go, what? His life as a child and as a teenager was destroyed because of alcohol. He swore up and down. He hated alcohol. He hated what it would do. He swore you would never touch it. And now he's an alcoholic? And finally, it hit me. I finally had a revelation of this verse of Scripture because this verse of Scripture of binding and loosening is dealing with forgiveness. And when I go back and I evaluate those who were able to stay the faith and those who slip back into alcoholism because I, I've seen them both ways, and I look at the ones who slip into alcoholism themselves, here's what I found in every case that I can remember. They hated alcohol and they never forgave their father for being an alcoholic. They never forgave him. And so what they did by lacking forgiveness is they themselves bound that spirit of alcohol, that sin of alcoholism in his own heart, and it was only manifested later. If you do a study, you will find that the majority of homosexuals were, were abused by a homosexual when there was a child. And they harbored, not all cases, but I'm telling you the majority, I guarantee is the truth. The and, and, and what happened is instead of forgiving the one who committed that sin against them, they bound that thing inside of them, they hated it, and they became the very thing they hated. How many people grew up in an abusive home and then when they become a parent, they are abusive? Come on, church. What is it? It's lack of forgiveness. It's, and, and they bind that thing inside of them. They hate their parents for getting a divorce. Never forgive their parents for a divorce. Guess what? They of all people are prime candidates to get a divorce. Every area you think about, I'm telling you, I can point to it so many times where they were sinned against, they felt like they had a right to be angry, and legally you do, but do you want to be right or do you want to be free? I want to be free. As a leader, 
And I don't have this problem in this church. This church is amazing. I, I love you, and you guys are so amazing. But through the years of ministry, there have been many times when I have been pooped on. I mean, leaders get pooped on. That's just all it is, okay? I remember the very first time I learned this lesson deeply, and I, I will close with this. I was at my first church. This is before Brownsville. And our youth ministry exploded from 25 to 140 in a church of 200. And um, uh, the only room that was big enough to accommodate all of our young people was the fellowship hall. And so I had gone to my pastor, and I told him, you know, I asked him, I didn't tell him anything, I asked him if I could have the fellowship hall and convert it every week for our youth service, very much like Pastor Jeff has to do here. And, and he gave me the blessing and, and, and so forth. And so we did. We just converted that fellowship hall into an amazing youth room. But he made a leadership mistake, which we all do, and that was he never communicated to the congregation what was going on. And without me knowing it, people started bad-mouthing me behind my back, saying, oh, Richard, he's taken over the church. He's taken over the church. He's just taken over the church, blah, 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 blah. These are people who love me. I mean, listen, this church adored me, okay? It was like God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, Brother Richard, okay? I mean, it's just it's right up there with the Trinity. They loved me. You hear me? They loved me. But they started yan yan in behind my back. Richard's taking over. He took over our fellowship hall. He's, he's taking over the church. You know, just, you know, you know how Christians are. They love, how to, love to cast cur curses on one another. I'm not worried about the curses out there. I'm going to worry about the curses in the church. I didn't know any of this was going on. In fact, my, some of my main supporters were, were doing this against me because of just lack of communication, bad leadership, and we've all made the flaws. I've made leadership flaws too. And uh, I went into depression for the first time in my life. And as you know, I'm not a depressed person. I ding off walls. And I went into depression for the first time in my life. And I went into deep depression for three months. And uh, God's blessing my ministry and so forth. And I'm in deep, deep, deep depression. And, and at that time, I opened the church every morning at 5.30 in the morning for prayer and for the uh, daycare that we had. And I went three months without hearing from God. I'm telling you, I was in a cloud. These curses were spoken over me. And I was in desperation. I was praying. I was fasting. I said, God, where are you? What is going on? I'm, I'm repenting of sins that I never even thought of. You know, I'm just, God, what's wrong with me? Forgive me, Jesus. I mean, I, I'm seriously, I'm just repenting. And, and uh, one morning, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I'm praying, and I'm just in this funk. And the Holy Spirit, out of mercy and grace, spoke to me. He said, Richard, do you want to know what's going on? I said, yes, sir. He said, Richard, what you don't understand is your church is cursing you. And he told me who it was. He t I, listen, don't get freaky on me, okay? He doesn't do this to me all the time, so you can relax. But this time, like, oh, my God. <laughs> I know how people are, okay? Although, Lord, you can do that if you want. But, but. but for some strange reason, this is one of the most unique experiences I ever had in my life. He told me who it was. He told me what they were saying. I mean, literally told me what they were saying and who it was, blah, blah, blah. And when he got through, he said, now do you want to know how to handle it? I said, yes, sir. He said, you have a choice. You now have all the information and you can go to the right people and you can have them crucified and you can defend yourself. Because they're all talking behind my back. He said, or you can keep your mouth shut and I'll be your defender. I said, no, that's an easy choice. And then he said this. He said, Richard, he says, I want you to forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. He literally said those words. He said, I want you to forgive them because these people love you. They don't know that they're throwing curses on you. They don't understand the funk that they're putting you on because of their words. You understand your words are very powerful. Life and death are in the tongue. And, and, and they don't understand. They're ignorant. Forgive them. 
And I remember, son, I remember for 30 minutes all by myself in that sanctuary walking around crying uncontrollably, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Father, forgive them. These people love me, but they, they're, they're speaking out of their soul. They're speaking out of ignorance. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. I mean, I'm weeping and wailing and bawling uncontrollably for over 30 minutes. And when I got through, I felt like I was born again again. I'm telling you, everything was gone and everything was lifted. And I kept my mouth shut. And within two weeks, I saw the Lord bring me in front of the church board, in front of my accusers, and give me the largest raise I've ever had in ministry. That's a good place to clap right there, church. Listen, if you want to be right, you can be right and miserable. Or you can forgive and be set free. Can I tell you, first of all, the Lord has graced me in this area. He really has. It's a gift of mine for mercy. You know, I, I, I love mercy. Oh, I love your grace. I love your mercy. But I love mercy. But here, here's, here's, here's honestly what I, what I say to myself. I go, Lord, there is a thing called judgment day. When everything that is hidden shall be revealed. And Lord, I'm a human being. I don't see things clearly. And I understand that some of my own offenses are probably from my own misunderstandings. They're probably from me, not from anybody else. I think they did me wrong, but it's probably my own misunderstanding. Okay? And, and so, but there's the thing called Judgment Day when everything that is hidden shall be open. And I know one day everybody will f understand what really is the true story. And that's good enough for me. That's good enough for me. It liberates you. It sets you free. Church, I don't care what you've gone through. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. All you're doing is destroying yourself. And you know what? Listen to me. You will have to let it go numerous times. It's not a one-time event. Because something will happen, and it will come back again, and you've got to let it go, let it go, let it go. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I... I'm so grateful that you are the master who has forgiven me of the 80,000 year debt. Lord, I'm so thankful that you not only forgave me 36 years ago, but you forgave me this morning. Your mercies are renewed every morning. Father, I ask that you would expose the demonic lie of the devil that would tie us up in knots, tell us that we have a right to be offended, and we have a right to hold on to our offenses. But God, give us the grace, the mercy, the strength to do what is beyond our own personal ability. Give us supernatural grace to release, to forgive, to set free.